it is cold, but the amazing thing is on this river, there's the sea over there. What's happened is, is one of those easterlies has come in and that's when East Anglia gets cold. This is an easterly, so the waves and wind is piling up on the shore, changing the shape of the, uh, of the nest out here, pr probably by the minute. Uh, as the waves start to pound it. But the amazing thing is, on the river, although I've got that wind and I've got the tide, I've got no waves. So it's brilliant. I've got all that power on flat water. Look at her. Just a little bit of Genoa out. The sun is shining, but it is cold. <laughs> this is the first kind of winterish day of sailing that I've had. Yesterday was lovely. Just the pullover. Wow, somebody's just come in through the bar. Boy, you brave person. There's a yacht over here that's just come in through the bar. Well, I wonder what that was like. From Google Earth, you can see the ridges on the end of the nest created by the intermittent easterly gales. And as you head up the oar away from the bar, both banks are pure shingle. Deep water right to the edges. But this whole area has been a battleground for decades as the shifting stones and the east coast mud fight for dominion over the lower reaches of the ore. At first you see outcrops of old river mud appearing through the shingle, the powerful currents draining the three rivers of the Ald, Ore and Buckley shifting mud and river debris one way and the storms shifting the area of conflict up and down the estuary with man's occasional interventions which always have, and always will be, in the long term, doomed to failure. The bird numbers start to increase as the mud starts to take over. But just before losing sight of the mouth of the river, you see the first signs of the once extensive Second World War defence systems. Hitler's invasion strategists had cast their baleful gaze on the whole of East Anglia. So many tempting sheltered rivers and estuaries, great natural harbours everywhere. If they could get a decent bridgehead here, big enough to unload thousands of tanks, then their German armoured divisions could have swept through the flatlands of East Anglia and attacked London from the northeast. It's worth landing to have a look at the places where men of my father's generation stood and watched the sea with a genuine expectation that any day soon a German landing fleet could come for them. Now this isn't sea wall, I think that this is a fortification. Mortars behind there, observation from there, covering the entrance to the river. You could drop the mortars exactly where you wanted to. Pillboxes are really just well protected observation posts. From here, they would have called in a torrent of fire from gun batteries inland. But this pillbox is unusual in that it has a defensive revetment for additional forward artillery or anti aircraft guns, but it would have been a pretty hot spot to defend in the event of an invasion. <laughs> What a frightening thing it would be to, to be told to defend this position against a battleship, a German battleship coming up here. Whew. Be Man, I'm lucky to have come from a generation where we never had to fight a war. We Brits, as a nation I mean, not as individuals, love a good scrap. But all the wars Britain has been involved in since I was born in 1955 have been optional. Optional for our government as well as for the men who fought and died in them. Now there's a thought. But the Second World War, the one my dad fought in, was a real high stakes affair people really were fighting for their liberty. Uh -huh. 
After a mile or so the oar splits either side of Havergate Island, an RSPB run bird reserve and soon after taking the northward arm comes the entrance to the Buckley River. It became my favourite refuge through the winter of 2009-10 and it never failed to delight. It has an all-tide anchorage near its muddy mouth and the river is sheltered from every direction. It also has several landing spots for shallow drafters like the slug. On cold winter days being able to get ashore for a brisk walk really helps to get the circulation going. The first place to land is a small wharf, Boyton Dock. Bricks, clay and coprolite coming out, coal coming in. On the other side of the sea wall is Boyton Marshes, 175 acres of really badly drained land which is just the way the owners like it because they're the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. They're keen to keep the place exactly the way it is. They cut some hay from here and keep a few hard working English cattle. The cattle are there to keep the scrub under control and poach up the margins where their damp pastures blend into the open stretches of water. The cattle keep everything wonderfully muddy because that's the way the birds like it. As a cameraman the low sun combined with the mists clinging to the frequent stretches of open water, the general overwhelming dampness of the place produces some great light. And as a naturalist, well, there are more than enough birds to keep anybody happy. And to hear as well, Every bush is alive with the sound of the warblers. The acoustic is wonderful. Yet every now and then it all goes quiet. Then you know that one of the top predators has arrived. Usually the threat comes from the air. But sometimes the danger comes in at a much lower level. You were to spot me, didn't it, dude? RSPB, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. God bless you. However, I think you should take the royal out because the royal family in this country like to shoot endangered birds. I'm on the fen near the quay. And it's a misty, moisty day, look at that. You can see the moisture hanging. And here are these flooded pastures. And across here is a very well made concrete bridge. And the reason it's well made is that it was made by the military because on the other side this was the main access road to these buildings. All over the marshes you can see signs of the military. There's a pair of concrete blockhouses, really weird shapes. I was walking along the dike here from the boat and in the mist I could see this shape and first of all I thought it was a pile of sugar beet and then they don't do sugar beet down here and then I just... Hard to get to though. You know, I think there is a way across somewhere through there and then across there's some sort of pipe across the middle here. Great. Is that another one? Yeah. Two of them. How many more? 
There's something else over there, look. Not sure what that is. Look at my head down. I don't really want to be spotted. I am wearing brown. No idea what the slots of the stone are for. It turns out that towards the end of the Second World War, this was a tank training area. They towed a target on a railway backwards and forwards across the marshes while trainee tank gunners took pot well, shots at it. Cattle stand in here a bit. Some reinforcing bars. I'd like to talk to some of the men who spent their wartime years out in East Anglia sitting in these gun emplacements. I assume they weren't intensively manned, but nevertheless, there must have been people whose job it was was to look after them, guard them. Are called Merkins. Got Radio 4 on to keep me entertained. Got tara masalata and French bread. There's my candles for heat. And I've just bought this flexible LED thing. So that should be enough light for me to read, which will be great. <laughs> and uh, for supper, I've got um, soup. Um, uh, people tell me you could explode a can, but I, I just can't see how you ever could. Because the can's never going to boil before the water does, so that's fine. You, know, you just need to be a bit careful when you open it, because it might spurt hot stuff. But uh, I'm going to eat straight out of the can, which has saved me some washing up. And there on the warm plate is a sausage roll. <laughs> and it's only quarter to seven, so... Uh, the earliest I can go to bed really is half past eight and then I get up as soon as it gets light. Back to Radio 4. Tony. Look, he hasn't said anything true yet, has he? So that's got to be true by the look. I don't care how many points I lose, I'm going to get one and that is it. Where would I be without Radio 4? Oh. A few yards upstream of Boyton Wharf is a small jetty for the bicycle ferry that crosses the river here during the summer months. But it doesn't run in the winter months, so who's going to object to me using the jetty for an hour or two of an evening? I visited the Buckley River at least a dozen times through that winter, and every time I discovered something new about it. Yes, I'm going to get a lot of this. It's a misty, damp morning. I mean, it is the marshes, so that's what you'd expect, is mist and damp. Weatherman, wind guru, says it's supposed to clear up by about 12. So it's quite a long time, because it's seven o'clock now. And you can hear the birds. I had discovered that my little baton that I use for echo sounding, you can always use as a kind of low impact paddle. It bends away from you, but that's all right, you're applying pressure. I came up the Buckley River last night and then stayed beautiful, quiet evening. Dark, of course, no moon, not much in the way of stars either. Then I woke up at about half past six and set off down here through the mist. See, I now know the river enough to navigate it in the fog. And my aim is to look at these rivers in all their clothing. Not as a local does, not right through the year, but I'd like to see them when the sun's shining and when it's misty. The mud banks are just starting to emerge with the tide going down, so that gets the birds excited. So activity will start to pick up. Oh, fuck. New ground.
back afloat. <laughs> well, there we are, we're back afloat. A um, bit of a panic. Didn't really want to go ground up here because it would be a bad thing to do, get stuck. So I'm going to now go back to my gentle paddling. Don't know how that happened, I must have just come up against the mud bank. If I'd hit it, I would have been here until about four o'clock this afternoon, which given that I'm planning on going home today, tonight, would have been a bad thing. Righto, this is it Hawkeye. You are still not working. You're hanging over the stern now and you're not working. Hawkeye, I, I want my money back. It doesn't bloody work. Hello Hawkeye, I've put up with this for the best part of the whole summer. I really haven't had a functioning echo sounder. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that your device is so pathetic that it can't get through my hull. And even when, it, when you put it outside the hull, it needs really, really clear water to work in. Clear enough for me to see the bottom. What is the point of an echo sounder when you can see the bottom? Man! It's a stinking, horrible piece of equipment. Tuesday morning at about half past nine. Only got four layers on. Sun's just come out. Cold, damp night. Everything's pretty damp down below, but uh, sun shining. Just four layers. Pull over. T-shirt, shirt, wool pullover, hoodie. I have. I usually put on six layers before I give up, and stop sailing and go below. So that's my limit. I do have six layers I can put on and a scarf. But to be here on a Tuesday morning is a delight. No wind, that's fine. It's a bit of tide. Carry on up past the small fisherman's hard and up towards the second wharf. with the sand and gravel quarry it once served still clearly visible up behind it. And then the Buckley heads on yet further into the Suffolk countryside. You can go as far as your keels and your nerves will allow. For my money, the Buckley is definitely the best little estuary in East Anglia. Mm -hmm.